I am so excited to introduce our incredible panelists that we have here today. So we have uh, Shavi here, who's an infrastructure engineer at VoiceFlow, and he's also an open source community organizer for a variety of different organizations that we're going to chat about. Um, then we have Yana Boruto, who's the director of developer events and experiential marketing at HashiCorp. And we have Hans here, who's the online product group marketing manager at MathWorks, and he, he works at the intersection of, of innovation and open source there. So a lot of really great insights to share. So let's bring up our awesome panelists on stage and kick off the panel. Hello, thanks for having us. Awesome. Hello, everybody. Oh, I'm still sharing my screen. Whoops. <laughs> All right. So I am so excited to dive into this and to learn about each of you a little bit more. So I'd love to kick off with a round of introductions. Um, Jana, let's kick it off with you. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and please share a fun fact as well, something that folks wouldn't find in your in your bio. Yes, hi, I'm Yana. I've been doing uh, community building uh, focused on like developer communities for I guess a decade now, over a decade. Uh, and I've been at HashiCorp. Uh, we build infrastructure tools uh, for about six and a half years now, uh, doing a lot of the community building events, things like that. Um, I have a 12 year old dog named Angie and she has no teeth, so, but she's doing great. <laughs> oh, so cute. Okay, Hans, I see you up next on my screen. Can you share a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to see everybody again. And I'm Hans <laughs> Scharler, and I, I do work at MathWorks. I'm their online product, uh, or I'm sorry, online product manager, which covers our open source program and our uh, community, uh, community sites. Uh, fun fact for me is I have 30 followers on TikTok, so kind of big. Wow. Whoa. <laughs> That's super cool. I know you also have a cool Twitter account for your toaster. I believe oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I got into, uh, <laughs> into community building as, uh, when, when Twitter, uh, launched, I thought it was kind of funny and I wasn't sure what Twitter was all about. And so I hooked up my toaster to Twitter, um, back in 2008 and it, it gained more followers than I, than I have. So it must be doing something right something to learn from the toaster. I love it. <laughs> Shavian, can you share a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, so I'm uh, working as an infrastructure engineer at Wishflow using some uh, infra tools from HashiCorp. <laughs> and yeah, I'm currently organizing the um, Madrid DevOps Days conference, also the Madrid DevOps meetup, the Alexa community, and also the Google Developer Group here in Madrid. And as a fun fact, as you can see, I'm driving a lot of uh, open source communities. <laughs> That's awesome. Really cool. So I think, you know, open source and, and community, it's a really interesting intersection. And I don't think anybody really sets out to, you know, get into community in the first place and, you know, find themselves an open source. So I'd love to learn a little bit more about your, your career journeys and how you all sort of got into doing what you do today. Uh, so let's switch up the order here. Let's, let's kick it off with Hans. Yeah, my, my, my community uh, experience started with, I wanted to get into open source hardware and there was this very popular device called an Arduino and then all these open source clones <laughs> of Arduino. Uh, I wanted to get into it, so, but I was a software you know, person. So I was writing software. So I decided to create uh, open source software to support all of that hardware. And that led me to build a website. Then I set up a forum and then a blog and then it just kept, kept going. So we got to about a half a million users of that community and um, that's called ThingSpeak, and it's still still going strong after 10 years. Um, so that's how I got into it. It was like one step at a time. If I would have known all the work I would have had to put in, I probably wouldn't have done anything. You know, 10, 10 <laughs> years ago. But it was like slowly building it up. And it was also, uh, I also used a mixture of in-person events um, to, to build the community and, and uh, hold, hold online uh, events. And so that's how I got into it. And I have a lot of hobbies if, um, as you, you know, kind of pointing out and I like to do fun things. And so that allows me to, 
dip in to many different online communities cold. So I have to like, you know, if I want to get into barbecuing, I have to like join a Reddit, you know, Reddit group. And so I end up learning like community behaviors just because I have a lot of interests and, and my uh, interests change. So that's that how I got into it. Super cool. I'd love to see in the chat as well if, if any folks want to share how they got into community or doing what they do. I think everybody's story is so fascinating. And I don't think I've met anybody yet who like knew from high school or even like post-secondary that that's what they wanted to do. So it's always cool to see how people get into it. Um, Javi, what about you? How did you uh, get into it? Did you say Hannah? Shavi, sorry. Shavi, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I started uh, during the university. Uh, I found like a makers group here in the in the UPB, and there, well, I, we started like tons of hackathons, uh, open source projects. We were playing with Arduino, with Raspberry, with a lot of sensors, and yeah, and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, when I leave the the university um i started like um writing uh some technical articles and yeah i started um creating from the scratch uh the some conferences like the the bob's days and yeah i just joined uh some one of the most important here in spain uh, meetups and and open source communities to keep growing them and and also to to contribute there so yeah that's how, how i started in the open source community very cool indiana last but not least yeah um so i graduated college in 2008 in the u.s like during like the one of the worst financial crisis like crises and it was interesting to like okay how do i find a job i was living in cholera at the time um, and I ended up moving back to the Bay Area because tech was the only industry hiring. Um, and it, it's interesting. I, I started kind of customer success and then I ended up joining this company called Engine Yard. It's no longer around. It was a competitor to like Heroku. But I started working there around like 2009, 2010. And that's when like GitHub launched, New Relic launched. Um, and, and it was really interesting to learn about community and especially open source community back in the day. So Engine Yard was really phenomenal in terms of uh, like, for example, I work at a company called HashiCorp, right, which Mitchell Hashimoto founded. And back in the day, we sponsored Mitchell to work on Vagrant, right, which was an open source project that he was working at the time. So we did a lot to like support the open source, sponsoring conferences, sponsoring open source contributors, sponsoring open source projects, hiring open source contributors to work on them. So that was my exposure to early days of Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we'll we'll move on. Hopefully, Anna's connection comes back. Um, so I think you know everybody defines community um, really differently, and the open source community as well. So I'd love to learn what uh, what your role sort of looks like at your company with open source and, and how you actually define it. So let's kick it off with Hans. Sure, we um, we produce we uh, produce software and. We also have a couple thousand software engineers at our, our company, and we we use open source projects and things like that. So the open source program that 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 I manage is also about um, our developers participating and contributing to open source projects that that we rely on. So and also supporting them. So some of the things we've done is join the Linux Foundation or the Cloud Native Compute Foundation and uh, support projects like LLVM and, and uh, open source projects. So sometimes they need help in terms of writing documentation for Kubernetes or um, you know, bug fixes or cleaning up issues and things like that. So my, my role is about um, us as a company participating in these, these uh, open source communities, um, especially via, via GitHub. GitHub has definitely been the uh, center of our, our world for the last few years. Very cool. And Shavi, what about you? How would you define it from your perspective, you know, organizing various different open source communities yourself? 
Yeah, so here at uh, in in Voiceflow, uh, Voiceflow is a low code or no code uh, platform to build uh, like uh, basically conversations, and you can deploy to Alex to Alexa or Google uh, and all other platforms. So basically, what we encourage our developers is like every everything uh within voice flow is uh you can like you have a button to share with the community so we encourage all the developers to create uh good conversations and then share it with all the with the rest of the designers or developers because we have designers and also developers and also we are maintaining uh, some different like local chapters of our voice flow communities, like one in Japan, another one in global. And and yeah, this is how we are managing uh, at voice flow the, the open source also. Uh, we are using a lot of a lot of open source libraries and whenever we found a, an issue and and something like that, we always try to to create a bug, I mean, uh, sorry, a fix for the bug, <laughs> and and yeah, and contribute to the open source community. Very cool. So I think Yana is having some some internet problems, but hopefully she can come back soon. Um, but we'll keep the discussion going um, with with our awesome panelists here. So I'd love to learn um, what, in your experience, do you think actually makes us for a strong open source community. Uh, so let's kick it off with Hans again. Um, well, participation of all all forms. So th this is the, the the one thing I try to convey is that uh, a lot of people want to make the big uh, pull request to an open source project, or they want to make the big contribution or add new features. But a lot of, some of these projects just need help with the basics. You know, they have bugs in these these projects. They need help with those those fixes. Sometimes they need governance um, or they just need to know people are using their project so so they can stay interested and fix the security problems that come up over time um, instead of the software going stale. So uh, participation is is what I uh, talk about a lot and that's what I I do, um, you know, to set to set an example. But I think that's what makes the, uh, the communities um, thrive. But a lot of people think that the bar is really high. And so that's why I try to lower the expectation. Sometimes it's joining a mailing list, <laughs> liking some posts, re, you know, sharing some things on Twitter. Sometimes it's low effort, but um, people have this perception that it's hard to join these communities. So I, I try to talk about participation at all levels. And over time, you, you know, you may get to that, those high bars, but it's usually uh, you build up to it. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really great point. I think that's so applicable to to all kinds of communities, not just open source, and especially in the virtual world. I think you know everybody's experimenting, everybody's trying new formats, and I, I think it really helps with you know creating accessibility and, and and helping people feel like they can be a part of it and in a really low um, effort way, especially at the beginning when they first join. Um, Shavi, what about you? What what do you think makes for for a really incredible and amazing open source? source community yeah so i think well the, the the main thing for me is to have in the community like very active people like uh could like they contribute not every day but at least every week with uh different kind of of contribution doesn't matter the the contribution itself like a blog post a podcast a youtube uh that makes uh some engagement within the within the community i think uh this is really really important and also try to create uh, a lot of events now virtually try to um like invent uh, or try to do new ideas to create uh events like online hackathons within discord and tweets and a lot of new platforms that can create some engagement and also for the most like the most important contributors or 
for for the full community like every contribution that the people do to the community like uh giving their like uh, a gift and amazon gift card and like um uh, anything you know to create that uh, engagement so this is one of the most important things for me to create a, a strong community. Very cool. So I'd love to get some examples from each of you. You know, as I mentioned, everybody's sort of experimenting now, you know, with the virtual world and and, and some of us are, are now experimenting with hybrid events. Some, some regions have been able to go back to in-person. So I'd love to hear from each of you if there's a really special event that, that you're really proud of that you've done recently and, you know, what did that look like and what made it magical and, and, and really unique. So Xavi, let's kick it off with you this time. Yeah, so the the event that I'm really proud is is well was the, the last in person conference that we made here in Spain, which is the uh, DevOps Days Madrid. Uh, that was really, 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 really cool. Uh, great international speakers, uh, great organization. That was pretty fine and. <clears throat> During the pandemic, I mean, we have run a lot of uh, a lot of hackathons, and yeah, I mean, all the all the hackathons, uh, every hackathon that we made, uh, we tried new things, new tools, new platforms, and right now, like using Twitch uh, for the uh final event using discord and and all all those new platforms we are really proud because i think it's working fine and the community uh is uh reacting pretty well to the to to those events so yeah trying to reinvent the the wheel you know <laughs> That's really interesting. How do you like? I'm sure you did in-person hackathons before COVID struck. What did what does the difference sort of look like in the virtual space? Are you seeing more engagement, less engagement, or like what kind of things have you done to actually keep people um, interested in them? Yeah. Well, uh, thanks to Discord, we are seeing like pretty much the similar experience like virtual and, and in person because with Discord you can create like uh, some uh, voice chats within just a click and and you can jump on there and hi Jana. <laughs> Hi, Anna. So happy to have you back. Thank you. Joys of presenting at home where your internet goes out. But sorry, keep going. I'm here. <laughs> so happy to have you here. All good. It happens. Yeah, sorry. Keep going, Shabby. Yeah, so yeah, with with uh, thanks to Discord, I mean, the the in-person and the virtual hackathons, uh, the experience are pretty much similar. Very cool. Um, Hans, what about you? Is there an event that you're really proud of recently? And wh what did that look like? What made it special? Yeah, we we uh, we have an event called MATLAB Expo and it was, uh, you know, it's in, it's in person typically. And um, we tried to do this online and it was really successful. And um, one of the things we did for the first time was we uh, presented it to our community participants and we got really good engagement from the community members. Um, sometimes we would reserve those events for customers, and um, we we were really surprised by the uh, participation um, from from the community. So that that was really great to see that um, we can open up an event and get participation from from different groups. And and also we heard from a lot of people it was like. We would have never been able to go to an expo before because it required travel, and uh, so it actually made it more more accessible. So, hybrid events and hybrid uh, meetups and things like that are probably here to stay, um, just because of that accessibility. Um, you know, listening to your response before, you're you're inspiring me to take a look closer look at video and Twitch and live streams. Those are things I haven't ventured ventured into. So I've seen other communities really 
uh, do that well. There's always an event every week to tune into. There's always uh, content being created. Um, we focus a lot on getting uh, content out on YouTube and did some limited um, YouTube live streaming or Instagram live and things like that. But we haven't haven't really uh, gone down Discord or Twitch, but um, it's an interesting place to be. As far as a, an event, I, I attended as an attendee. I thought it was the LLVM uh, workshop did a really great job. Um, they, I really like branded shirts and stickers and <laughs> things like that. And I collect, when went to a lot of events, I'd collect these little mementos and they kind of tied in a t-shirt that they created um, with the event. And so it was kind of neat. We participated all virtually. And then after the event, you know, something showed up in the mail and that was, uh, that was really fun. That created a cool, cool experience for me. It kind of reminded me of the in-person side of it and, but got a lot of benefit of the, the virtual side. That's awesome. I love that when everybody receives some kind of like package or some swag and everybody opens it at the same time. I, I think yeah. that really kind of creates a sense of community. So I, I really love that as well. So Yana, I'm going to double back a little bit for a question uh, for you. So I, I'd love to hear what community actually means at, at HashiCorp, what it means to you. And then um, if there's an event that, that you'd like to share that you're really proud of as well. Yeah. Uh... I mean, community at HashiCorp, right? It's, it's woven into everything that we do. Um, and I think that's as I, you know, work with different companies and advise different companies, it's, you know, sometimes community can be this buzzword, right? Where it's like, oh, we really want to build this, uh, a community around our product or service, but it's just like, but what does that mean? Um, you know, for us, it's, it's about like having just really like two-way conversations, right? It's opening up those channels for feedback. It's, it's about like, connecting people to each other. It's about knowledge sharing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think about the early days, right? Like how Vagrant, our, our first kind of open source project took off. It was just Mitchell, right? Was out attending conferences and speaking and responding to GitHub issues, uh, responding on Twitter, right? Um, uh, encouraging people to like contribute as well. So just yeah, communities woven into everything we do, right? How we make decisions, um, like how we communicate with people, right? The, the programs that we launch um, to decisions that we make of like, okay, what do we put in the open source versus what do we put in our enterprise? Things like that. So yeah, community is super important to us. Um, and then events, uh, yeah, I mean, like all of us, right? All of our events had to go virtual. And so for us, what we really took a step back last year and we're like, why does our community attend? Like, why do they attend our conferences? And for us, right, because our our products are pretty technical. Um, it's like it's for the knowledge, right? It's the knowledge sharing, and it's for connections amongst each other. So we kind of like almost stripped the event kind of a, a bit bare, right? Removed sponsors, expo hall, any of the other satellite things, and just focused on giving folks a great con uh, uh, great content through like having a nice broadcast production and just kind of um, different like community features that allow them to connect to each other. That's very cool. And then following that that larger event, how are you sort of keeping the community engaged? Are you, are you doing any any smaller sort of localized or, or theme based events as well? Yeah, I mean, like like we all know, right? So community building, right? There's a set of programs and initiatives that you put in place, right? Depending on kind of the stage that your community is in. So an event is just kind of one piece of how you engage with them. So there's, you know, for us at HashiCorp, right? We have a learn forum with a community forum. We do these really cool like hashy talks that are just kind of streamed to YouTube. Uh, we have like our user group program, right? We have, I think 150 different user groups around the world. Um, so there's just like a bunch of different ways that we engage with our community or allow them to engage with each other throughout the year. That's incredible. Shavi, what about on your end with the with the communities that you organize? How do you keep, you know, the conversation going between the events and, and how do you kind of create that regular cadence of events that, that people could look forward to? Yeah, we usually um, have like between the organizers some uh, meetings, some like monthly, weekly or biweekly meetings. And what we try is to create like a full schedule for the for the next months, like two three months, uh, regarding the 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 events. I mean, not not only our events regarding the uh, and taking a look at the other 
communities, uh, the the events from uh, the the other like companies like AWS, like Google, Hasicorp, and panels uh, after that uh, release events and and all that kind of things. Very cool. So I think a topic that's that's really top of mind for for community professionals is is measuring the success of our communities. You know, getting management buy-in and and really showing the business impact that these communities actually make. So Hans, I'd love to kick it off with you. Um, what are some of the key um, KPIs that that you look at with your community, and how do you measure the success of your programs? Yeah, this, this is a really, really good topic. <laughs> Going to a bunch of different, bunch of different directions. Right. Um, the, the base model we use is what we, what is referred to as the viral growth model. So this is the attract, engage, and list model. And you define metrics for attract. So this could be visitors and visits to a page, um, and that's like just getting people to to these things. And then the engagement is, did they do something? You know, did they like a post? Did they comment on something? Did they ask a question? And then engagement is, did they contribute a file or write something up or go, you know, go, um, or enlistment is going that extra, extra mile. So most communities follow this like 99 and one <laughs> paradigm where there's lots of people who come in. There's 9% of the people like, are engaged and 1% is doing a lot of the, you know, so some people would call these power users, things like that. But um, those are like metrics for us as the community people in, in, in our team. Um, so one of the things I talk about is uh, you got to figure out what, what will compel the business to keep, you know, keep uh, investing in these areas. So what, what are the important things? So um, this, you know, how many uh, support questions, would have came through here would you have to have different support channels if you didn't have this this community so that's a an easy way to tie a business outcome in, into uh into the community um so i i like to to not talk all about the those metrics you know when i'm when i'm referring to on the business side i try to find what what's important um and so someone had told me about we were doing an email campaign and they said, you know, stop talking about open rate and stop and start talking about um, how much business that that email <laughs> caused. Um, Cause an email campaign is one of, one of many things you're doing inside of a, a company. And so if you focus too, too closely on that one act, um, you may, may not really figure out what, what is causing the business outcome. Yeah. Sometimes I worry that like that kind of correlates like I, I find demand gen and like community building to be like very different, right? So it's sometimes if you put a lot of these like stringent KPIs and it's like, okay, we did this one thing, what is the ROI? Because for me, yeah. yes, there are ways to measure, but also community building is, is a long game, right? I, I still think back, right, that the programs you put in place early on, right, over the years you, you see. So it's like, how do I, for example, we did our first user conference in 2015. Um, we had 300 people there. Uh, a, a large bank was one of the first people to talk about, hey, I, I, I'm using Vault in production. But then five years later, right, it becomes a multi-million dollar deal. Or some of those folks that attended that first conference are now core contributors or employees. So it's like, yes, that you can be strange about measurements, but also just having general buy-in from leadership that like there's a benefit to community building. Um, Bait and it, but just it, it takes years, I, I think. So that's kind of a, a hard one to also like prove. Yeah, that's why I, li I like to avoid um, those strong, those strong connections because they're really hard to uh, to assess and measure. And what if they drop, you know? So yeah, other, how do you assess like a feeling, right? How do you <laughs> assess someone's can like deeper connection to the, your product or service? Yeah, that's There's so true. There's definitely some related things that we discover if, if our our sales departments do win loss analysis, you know, measuring if, if they talk about community in those win loss analysis reports. Mm. So sometimes we'll right. search search trip reports for the word community and things like that, just to get some good uh, anecdotes and stories and things like that. That 
also uh, colors the, the, the feeling aspect that you just brought up. Yeah. Is there also, I mean, you know, like we're doing a bunch of different initiatives and pro programs. So it's almost interesting in this, in like the sales funnel, could you like there, cause there's a bunch of different touch points that then eventually get someone to convert into a paying customer. So I almost wonder if like, Hey, this person attended a user group or this person is active in our form, right? If those can also be touch points that you measure. So when you do see a deal that closes, like, okay, well they, read our white paper and they attended one of our user groups then. And so it's like, you can also tie community to that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's so important, you know, with community, with, with events, even what I do with, with field marketing in my role, like, you know, it's, a, 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 like that one event is not going to be the thing that influences somebody to buy, but it's, it's so important to track that and see where that event or, or that community touch point actually falls on the customer journey. So, yeah, I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, Shavi, what about on your end from, from the creator and organizer perspective, how, how do you measure uh, the success of, of your communities? Yeah, what we well, what we are using right now is just uh, pure numbers of the attendees, the visitors, and also and the most important, the reaction. So when we create, like when we think that like an event uh, would be fine, and then we we run it, and we see that that the people are not reacting, uh, they are not creating engagement or we are not having like um, the messages that we want in the community. We know that we don't have to talk, for instance, again about that topic. So that's pretty much the measures that we are doing in our, in our communities. Very cool. Yeah, I think you bring up a really interesting point, you know, when we talk about measuring success of things we kind of focus on what's doing really well but i'd love to hear on the flip side you know when you see that something is not working like you mentioned um when like how do you sort of evaluate it and how do you decide um whether you should try this type of program again or if you should pivot to something else um let's kick it off with yana for this one Oh, looks like she froze there as well. Um, okay, let's yeah. let's kick it off with Hans. <laughs> the fun of a virtual event. <laughs> yeah. Well, definitely getting latitude for experimentation is great. So you can uh, try some things out, and uh, and you know see see the response. I one of the things that you'll find what what I've found is that um, sometimes you got to go through the comments um on forum posts you have to be looking at your youtube comments that what's posted on social you may find a, a bug in your software but nobody reported the bug they're just all like talking about a problem or some workflow <laughs> and so um so finding bugs w is uh something that um that that you can you know do <laughs> if you do correctly i'm kind of reacting what you were saying uh, a minute ago but as far as uh, um, testing out programs, I think the uh, uh, I think you just got to be consistent. So we've had we've had people not show up to things. <laughs> I held a I held a uh, compiler uh, meetup at a local place, and I only I was the only person that showed up. So um, I used that opportunity to send out some tweets and. Uh, and when I held the event the next time, I had three people show up. So I think the way I've overcome events not really working out is just is just doing it again, <laughs> and and uh, being consistent. And, I agree. And, and I think building. you know, especially when when launching a community, I think it has to start small in a way to really to make sure that you know you're you're iterating and you're almost like co-creating it with with the folks that do come out and you're listening to them. And I don't think that's a failure if you have you know two yeah. or three people at that first one. Well, that's making, that's how you, you know, find that that one and that ninety nine one <laughs> um, out of a hundred people. Because they they're bought in from the beginning, they start helping out. They may organize the next event. They share 100%. with their network. So, it uh, it does take a lot of effort in the beginning. So I I try to uh, prepare people for that, <laughs> that that it's not not all exciting at at, at the very first, and it and it may never get exciting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's that 
consistent um, being there all the time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I just want to remind folks, if you have any questions for the panelists, please don't forget to drop them in the Q&A tab. I see a couple of really awesome questions there already. Um, we'll get to them in the next uh, five to 10 minutes. Um, but I'd love to start the discussion around you know, the future of events and the, the future of, of open source communities. I think you know, everybody right now is, is, is trying to figure out you know, what, what does hybrid even mean when are, when are are we going back in person? So I'd love to hear both of your perspectives. What does the future of open source community events look like? And, and how are you sort of thinking about it within your role and within the types of communities that you're organizing? Uh, so let's start with uh, Xavi for this one. Yeah, so what we are thinking is uh, fully hybrid uh, events, like virtual and in person, because right now, at least here in Spain, what we saw is like organizing some different events. Uh, we saw something like, like we didn't see before, like uh, people from all over the world, like South America, Central America and North America. And that was really, really great. So we think that this is an important think in the in the community to take into account so we will keep pushing the the that that i mean the the virtual world but also uh the in person because i mean having like taking a coffee with your teammates or with people that that you already or you are or you are just meet in the event is also important and and yeah so we are thinking about hybrid architecture <laughs> very cool um and hans what about you yeah it's a it's really funny because a year and a half ago you know probably nobody would have said hybrid events were our were our future <laughs> <laughs> yeah who would I, I don't think i never even heard the word until like a year and a yeah. half ago so i think it's i think the uh the, the really neat thing about online communities, the ones I participate in, the one, you know, the ones I manage, it's just that that flexibility and like how people uh, organized pretty quickly around um, these hybrid events or they change behaviors. We started incorporating Discord and going towards streaming. So I'm really impressed by the nimbleness of communities. So I'm I'm pretty excited about uh, the future of online communities. I read articles about, you know, how important they were for a lot of us getting through stay-at-home orders and quarantining and things like that. So, I'm I'm much more optimistic than I ever was, just because of what I've observed and how people reacted. Um, so, in terms of the future, definitely definitely hybrid events are are going to stick around. I think um, DEI type initiatives um, and inclusion things are going to be uh, even more critical to these uh, communities. Um, there's a there's a community I participate in that just did. Um, I bought my virtual ticket for $10. And it, when I got to the exit, it said, you know, add a second ticket um, for, for somebody else that maybe couldn't go to this event. Um, and so that that was really interesting. So I just did that. It cost twenty dollars, and 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 now somebody else got to go to the event. Um, and then when we attended the event, they they paired us up. So it was kind of like a built-in um, uh, mentor <laughs> or kind of chaperone type thing, you know. Like we we were all, you know. So I had somebody to talk to right away. Um, so I see, I see a little bit of what works in person. Um, like these uh, breakout sessions, like we used to call them hallway sessions, or you mentioned getting a coffee or whatever. I think some of that's going to translate over into the online space. And then the nimbleness of sending people money with Venmo and gift cards and branded merch to your door and drop shipping and all that stuff. So I think the future is, is, is uh, taking some of the physical um, experiences and translating them online and then what i'm excited about is just stuff i can't even think about is when when we're truly 
thinking virtually, like, what are we going to do? You know, I, I don't know how we're going to leverage all these things, and but it's going to be fun to, to see how it all plays out and uh, be a part of its story. Yeah, it's, it's definitely very exciting. I mean, it's I don't think anybody has the answer right now and everybody's experimenting. Um, in, in a virtual event that, that I did recently, actually one that I, I'm really proud of, we leaned into a really fun theme. It was all about the kind of this topic, the future of events and the, you know what that sort of looks like. So we leaned into a back to the future theme and it really went into you know the movie franchise. And we actually had the, the co-producer and the co-writer of Back to the Future join. Nice. Um, but one of the panels uh, as part of that event it was called The Great Debate. And we, we had a few speakers kind of um, sharing their, some of their perspectives around this great debate that, that folks are having internally within their companies about, you know, how as we plan for, for 2022, are we going back in person? Is it hybrid? Is it full virtual? And one of the panelists had a really interesting insight and in that it, it doesn't have to happen simultaneously. I think a lot of people get kind of stuck in that thinking that, you know, there's something happening virtually and at the same time, you need to have that that hybrid or in-person watch party or experience happening. But there's a way where you can think about it where, you know, you do a big virtual event, but maybe you do a smaller in-person event for, for a region where restrictions are a little bit looser and, you know, it's, it's safe to do it um, in a COVID friendly way. I guess, and it could be at a, at a different um, a time or, or a completely different week. So I think that was really eye-opening for, for some folks as well, that you know those two things don't have to be happening simultaneously. Cool, so I wanna jump over to some of the questions that I see here in the chat. Um, some really great questions here from Kofi. Um, so do you find that running more smaller scale events or a few large scale events drives more engagement from the community? Uh, so let's start with Hans for this one. Yeah, this, yeah. Um, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> the, uh, what I mean by that is, is I think the, the smaller ones you do find um, lots of engagement. You can, um, if you have a lot of structure around an event, and three people show up then you know you can drop some of the structure and you get into some conversations and and i think you said this at the top uh, about where networking is so is so important and the connections between people and among people are so important so you a small event turns into the thing that everybody is there at the event <laughs> that they want to do so you can, you're loosening the structure and you're maximizing the thing they wanted in the first place is like making some connections and being useful to other people and finding people that, uh, so they can see, uh, talk to the person that they've seen answer a question on a forum and, and things like that. So I think the answer is, yeah, the, the small ones like build up, but the larger ones, when you can stick to some structure generates a lot of content and it generates, um, recordings and transcripts and blog posts and tweets and engagement in a different way so they're uh, they're both they're both really 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 important um, I like building up because then when I have content to put out then those engaged people those enlisted people are gonna amplify it and so yeah I think it's a it is it is a combination of the of those two yeah cool yeah I, I totally agree with you, Hans. I mean, the smaller ones are pretty important because that uh, are like less hard to organize. So yeah, you will see like the community. We have some our regular activity, but at some point, it's good to have like a large event with a lot of sponsors and a lot of things. Uh, that's really important also because uh, there you can show how big is your community. So yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Both are. Yeah, absolutely. That's what that's really what we're all about at Bevy as well. You know, any folks that are that are starting with the, with a large scale conference, we really encourage them to to continue um, to continue building that into a community and and create a community program out of that. So really, really cool that that you sort of uh, highlighted that as well. 
Um, so continuing on with the Q&A and folks, if you have any questions for the panelists, now would be the time to, to add them to the Q&A and I think we'll be able to get through all of them. Um, so let's see, another question here. Aside from the incentive of getting credit for building or contributing something cool and useful, are there other ways uh, where you drive participation in your communities? Uh, so Shavi, let's start with you for this one. Yes, so what we are doing is not only like giving some swag or, or uh, gift cards and all those things, what we are uh what well we started like two months ago and it's working really really fine so we invite people to to the events to talk like when we are running like a panel like this one we invite not only the panelists like some of the most important contributors uh to the virtual stage uh, to to discuss with them and anything that the for, at least for us, is working really, really fine and is creating a great engagement. Awesome. And Hans, what do you think? Yeah, I, I, I like that answer a lot because uh, lightning talks is a, is a way to, um, if you see people doing great things and inviting them to an event to go, hey, talk about that thing you made. We also, uh, um, we have a community blog and so we'll we'll do a community q a so we'll interview the person ask five questions and then publish that blog so sometimes it's uh obviously that, that's kind of a, an incentive where they're um they're getting their work out in a larger larger audience and they get to see you know their their blog post about their project what i tell people because i'm involved in lots of little niche communities is find find the currency of the community so like I'll just give you an abstract example. Like on Twitter, it's like likes and retweets is the currency of the of the community. And sometimes when you see something um, interesting, that retweet or that quote quote retweet is is uh, the currency of Twitter, and that helps people know that like you know they they've done something and and by doing that, you're sharing it with your network. And so yeah, so whatever yeah. your whatever your community has as a currency, you, you can you can spend it very freely yeah i really like that giving, yeah giving voice to the to the community yeah. very well yeah absolutely um really interesting question here from alva i think you know folks that are that are kind of new to to their community builder careers will find it um helpful uh so she asks how do i approach being a community builder if i don't have a technical profile to what extent do i have to know the technical details of the product um yeah either one of you whoever wants to jump in for this question it, it is a good question um yeah so I, I have lots of, I have a technical background, but to say I know our 200 products or tools or I'm a domain expert in, in deep learning or autonomous systems, I would never characterize myself as that. So the, uh, the great thing is, is that if you're, if, uh, if community is your thing, you'll, you'll find a way to, to, to make it happen. It's, it's people. And so yeah. if people, is people your thing and building connections, that's, that's the thing. So when I don't know uh, something, I say it and I connect people together. I, oh, I happen to know someone that might answer this and, and they may answer and not know themselves, but I build these connections and then uh, sometimes get out of the way. And so I'm yeah. definitely in the camp where I can't say that I'm, uh, as, as much as uh, I am technical, it doesn't doesn't mean I know everything. But I like people and I like making the connections. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah Shavi, on you, on your end, on the flip side, you you do have that technical background. Do you, how helpful do you, do you feel it is, and would you be able to do it without it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I also have a technical background, but I mean, for the communities, if you want to create communities, to engage people, to meet people, to create events. I mean, the the technical background, I think that it's not mandatory. You will see during uh, during the event, seeing the results, seeing the 
the the reactions on the on all the platforms that you have like twitter social media uh slack whatever you will see that where are you going to to drive your community so that's not needed at least for me uh, to have a, a technical background yeah to connect it to the the beginning topics we both mentioned arduino and our and our opening uh and uh, makers and things like that if you go to a maker space it's a it's a blend of people with technical backgrounds and artists and people with ideas so sometimes they need to to see something very technical and then the artist side will will remix the idea into something new and the technical person could have never done that and so i think it takes it takes uh it takes all those people and so if you're if you're an idea person or if you can connect two ideas together to make something new that is just as valuable as the person building the uh the the building blocks absolutely and i think you, you touched on something really interesting uh, it's like also i think like just being really vulnerable with the community that you're building and just being open with them and sharing that you know i'm i'm here to learn along with you and i'm not an expert in this topic but let's learn together yeah. i think that's really powerful as well so alba yeah. hopefully that's that's helpful and hopefully um you you go for it we really encourage you even if you don't have that technical background um, let's see, another great question here from Kofi. Um, how would you rank the utility of forums or message boards versus events in building community engagement? Is, is one more valuable or are they kind of on par with each other and like work together? Uh, so Shavi, let's, so let's kick it off with you. Yeah, for me are completely different things, different uh, way of, uh, of uh, interact with the uh, with the communities, uh, for me, a forum is a place where the community can ask and reply some uh, questions, uh, issues, concerns, all all those things. And and you know, on the other hand, we have the 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 meetings, we have the the events, the hackathons. So for me, are are completely completely different are and are, are at least are very valuable because if you are if you're having right now a community and uh, people within your community are building things and then when the people ask something like help needed and you don't have a reply for him or for her uh, this is like the, the the your community is not running well so for me both are are the same as i mean has the same value very cool um so before we jump into the breakout rooms i just have one last quick question for both of you um what kind of resources and then you know professional development um do do you personally um use like any books that you'd recommend to to help you on your community building journey there's, there's a lot of, a lot of good resources that have come out in the last year or so some really good books i'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, the business of belonging that's such a such a great book and i attended that the uh the book tour amazing for that so that that's a really great uh great book there's also uh people powered and uh, what i like about both books is there's there's kind of uh if you don't know where to start and you're not measuring things you don't know about virtual or um, viral growth models or incentive loops and things like that both books kind of give frameworks so for all aspects of community building on uh, like onboarding and uh, how to measure their success or how to tie them into business um, impact they they both have frameworks that you can kind of start with and then uh, adapt them to different places so those are those are uh there's two really great books in the last few years that have been been really really important for a community very cool yeah we're, we're of course really big fans of the business of belonging here at Bevy too uh Shavi what about you any any cool resources or things that you have found helpful yeah no books but yeah a lot of uh YouTube videos uh from uh AWS community builders 
uh, from the DVG, the Google Developer Groups. And yeah, they have a lot of uh, resources that, that help me a lot on how to organize everything. I mean, from the scratch or just improve yourself. So yeah. Very cool. Hans, I see a question here in the chat. Do you mind just dropping the name of that book again? Um, just let us know what it is. And if you can if you can put it in the chat as well, that'd be super helpful. Okay, I'll do it. So before we jump into the breakout rooms, um, also just wanted to share um, an upcoming conference that we have coming up. So it's called the CMX uh, Summit and their theme is Rise and it's all about the rise of the community industry. This is the premier conference for community professionals um, taking place on August 31st to September 2nd. You can RSVP at cmxhub.com. And then we also have a booth set up for it here, which, we'll see, which you'll see at the top of your screen where you can learn more about it. So hoping to see a few folks that are here today at the conference. Um, so yeah, I just wanna say a huge thank you to Hans, to Shavi, and to, to Yana as well, who, who unfortunately had some, some internet problems, but was able to share some great insights. Thank you.